This is Unit 3, Video 5. In this video, we will talk about resonance structures. So it turns out that some molecules are not well described, uh, described by just one Lewis structure because uh, the true arrangement shows the electrons uh, that are not locked in, but the electrons are allowed to move between a few bonds. And so the true structure will be a blend, you'll see, a blend of two or more individual structures. An example of it is these two molecules. This is ozone, which we'll look at in the next slide. Well, these are ozone. So we draw ozone with one double bond and a single bond, but in truth, they're actually equivalent. All the bonds are equivalent. Here is the ozone molecule with measured bond lengths. Now you'll notice that here you have 1.278, and here you have 1.278. The bonds between the two uh, oxygens are equivalent. Now this is strange because the way we draw a Lewis structure, we can either draw the bonds on the left or we can draw the double bond on the right. And because experimentally we're showing that these bonds are actually the same length, they must both either be double bonds or single bonds or a mixture in between. And that's exactly what happens. The real molecule is a resonance or a mixture of the two individual molecules. So what we'll do is we'll have to show this resonance using a double-sided arrow, double-headed arrow like so. Uh, and ex again, this comes from experiment. Experimentally, both of these bonds are the same length. And it's pretty amazing that scientists can measure the bond lengths to, do, to this accuracy. Because they are the same length, we have to account for that in our Lewis structures. So a good example of it is this polyatomic ion called formate. The electrons that form on the second CO bond can actually move. In other words, these electrons right here, the second bond, can move from here to here and then back again. So these electrons are allowed to, allowed to move because you have equivalent bonds since you have equivalent atoms. Electrons cannot move this way. This is not allowed, partly because hydrogen can't accept more than two electrons. But even if it were a fluorine, then that would not happen. It is between equivalent atoms that the electrons can move. So because they can move, they are not localized. The electrons are delocalized. So we have to show uh, the electrons. It's a way of showing the electrons being both here and here. And the way we do that is with a double-headed arrow. Again, this is the case whenever you have equivalent atoms. So let's do an example of this. Here it asks us to do a few things uh, to prove which has the shortest uh, bond. But what we'll do is we'll draw SO3. Now, if you draw SO3 properly, you'll see that SO3 actually has one double bond. I won't take the time to draw this Lewis structure, but pause the video to make sure you can draw it properly. And the Lewis structure should look like this. We've actually done it in a previous uh, example problem. So because this double bond here on the right side can also be at the bottom or on the left, we have to draw all three possibilities. So I'm going to draw another molecule where the double bond is on the bottom. And then one more molecule. So let's fill them in with electrons. And I'll draw one more molecule where the double bond is on the right, uh, rather on the left. Like so. I'll go ahead and fill in all the electrons. And then what I'll do is I'll draw double-headed arrows between these molecules, showing that the true molecule is actually a blend of all three of these. Now, if I draw the SO32 minus, structure. Here's the SO3 2 minus structure. Uh, you don't have to have any double bonds. In fact, because you have two extra electrons signified by this minus 2, you get yourself single bonds all around. So this is SO3 2 minus sulfite. This is called the sulfite polyatomic ion. So you have those two extra electrons on sulfur to give you a total of, in this case, uh, it'd be 26. Now, you can also draw a charge because this is a charged a particle. Uh, we can either put brackets around the whole thing and put a charge down, or we can put individual charges on each one of the uh, atoms. And this will be the form, what we call the formal charge. So you'll notice that in the molecule up here, you actually have essentially uh, two single bonds and a double bond. Now, overall, you could think of this as being the single bonds as having some, each of them now have some double bond character. These are the oxygens. Each of these single bonds have 
the electrons partially existing here, here, and here. So you have more of a double bond character. Now, the more bonds you have, the shorter the bond. And in the case of SO32 minus, you have full single bonds. So because these are all single bonds, this will be longer. Single bonds bond is longer. And in this case, because you have partial double bonds, bond is shorter. So partial double bonds. bond is short. So this is actually experimentally verified. We would see experimentally that the bond distance in sulfur trioxide, which is this compound, is shorter than in sulfite, which is this compound, or polyatomic ion. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's move on and talk about exceptions to the octet rule. Uh, there are usually three types of exceptions uh, that we talk about. And these are ions or molecules. Remember, these could be polyatomic ions. When you say ions, we mean polyatomic because they have covalent bonds holding them together. Uh, that have an odd number of electrons. Uh, ions or molecules with less than eight, less than an octet, and some with more than eight. And this is called an expanded octet. This, as you'll see, is the most common exception that we'll encounter. All right, so an odd number uh, is pretty rare. Here it says relatively rare. However, there are molecules like NO, this is nitrogen monoxide that exists. And if you total up the number of valence electrons in NO, nitrogen only brings five. Oxygen brings six, and you get yourself 11. You have yourself an odd number of electrons. So there's really no way to draw a structure with everyone having eight since it's an uneven number. So you can actually draw them both. You can actually draw resonance in this case. Uh, but the more stable structure um, is actually the one that has the proper formal charge. If we calculate formal charge, formal charge of this oxygen is minus one. Formal charge of this, uh, oh, rather, sorry, formal charge of this oxygen would be zero because you get six minus six. Here you have five, so this one's zero as well. The formal charge is on here. You got six minus one, two, three, four, five. This is plus one and this is minus one. So this is actually the better structure. So this is, uh, so in other words, you're going to put more electrons on oxygen, which is shown by this structure. And that makes sense because oxygen is more electronegative, so it'll take more of the electrons. So that's uh, a little more uh, details about that substance. Now the second, uh, oh, uh, s some more atoms that have fewer than eight a very famous atom is boron. We call boron the moron, since uh, it can't uh, sometimes doesn't have eight. It's uh, a few fries short of a happy meal, as they say. So, since boron exists and this compound exists, BH three. If you total up the number of valence electrons, again you have three here, one from each hydrogen plus three. You got a total of six, and there's no way to draw this with an octet. So boron ends up having only six electrons, which is fine. Yeah, boron can actually handle just six electrons. Uh, same thing happens when you have a halogen that bonds with boron. Boron is famous for doing this. Uh, the uh, fluorine will not, uh, technically, if you take a look, you can draw this with a double bond, but fluorine will not end up sharing any more electrons. This one's a bit strange because technically, here's what you've got for the structure. If you total it up, it'll look like this. Technically, fluorine could share a double bond and complete boron, but that will not happen, partially because fluorine is the most electronegative, does not want to share electrons. But boron is fine with six, that's the idea. All right, more than eight electrons. Uh, this is the largest class of exceptions. And here it says, uh, third period onwards, you can accommodate more than an octet. What this means is if you have the periodic table, elements in the third period actually have D electrons available. So this is 3D. And in other words, they have orbitals available for bond. You don't have that in the second energy level because there is no such thing as a 2D subshell. So second row elements and before cannot do this. Obviously, the one there's no such thing as the 1D subshell. That does not exist either. But the 3D subshell exists. So beyond the third period, D orbitals can be used to 
participate in bonding. And the extra electrons will go on the central atom, as you'll see. So we'll probably do a few examples. In fact, uh, just do ICL4 minus. If we total up the number of electrons, iodine brings seven, and so does chlorine. There's four of them, that's 28, plus 735, plus one more, you get 36 electrons. Now, if you distribute these electrons around the molecule, in this case, iodine goes on the inside, since chlorine is more electronegative. Put all three or all four chlorines on the outside. And you have 36 to distribute. So far, you have 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. Notice we've distributed 32 electrons, but we have a total of 36 to distribute. So we have to put four more electrons. What will happen is they'll go on the inside. Now, this will make it look a little strange. But iodine actually has, not an octet, but it has, if you count, 12 electrons on the inside. Iodine has 12 electrons. Now make sure I didn't overdo this. So we get eight around each. That's uh, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. That's correct. All right. And you can try one on your own. Uh, do the same thing, and you'll see that phosphorus, in this case, also has an expanded octet. Both phosphorus, by the way, and iodine can actually accommodate expanded octets because they are using the 3D. They're uh, after the second shell, they're in the third shell. All right, and that uh, wraps it up for us. We'll do molecular geometry next time.